This is a headline that came out today that GE is laying off 20% of its workforce in uh, their uh, wind power, uh, onshore wind power division. Mm -hmm. And basically, it's because it's, it's not economically feasible. So I wanted to get your view on this and then also try to think through if we are to believe the yield curve, we're probably going to have a pretty significant recession, global mm -hmm. recession in, you know, in the near future, let's say, if we're not in one right now, in which case the, the companies, these big corporations are going to be pulling back on CapEx. And so how is that going to affect the energy landscape, I guess, is my question. But my guess is you're probably not surprised by this headline. No, it's, uh, I mean, all of these companies are, have, have carved out a, a piece of their budget, a relatively small percentage, but if you're a big company, it's a lot of dollars, to pursue um, high risk, and I say high risk uh, in terms of capital return kind of projects. And, and, and wind and solar and hydrogen and, you know, you could probably uh, think of a few more are in that category. And so those are things that are, they're money losers today. And they'll probably be money losers for some time in the future. But, you know, there may be advances or circumstances that make them money makers in the future. And so that, that's the way big companies balance their, their, their budget, right? It makes sense. Why are they money losers today, Art? Like what, why, why aren't they profitable? Low productivity. First of all, I mean, wind is, is expensive. Um, and, and, and I'm sure everybody watching this, this, this interview discussion has heard that, you know, wind and solar are by far the cheapest forms of energy. Right. I mean, somebody on CNBC said it, so it must be true. Well, you know, on, on a on a point forward basis, that is true. In other words, once you paid for, you know, for for all of the investments and you've got the wind turbine up and running. Uh, yeah, that's true. But that's not the way we figure cost benefit, is it? <laughs> right. Right. Total cost, not just the cost that's you want to acknowledge. Cost. The, the other problem with with renewables, other than the fact that they're intermittent, and I, you know, that's that's another problem altogether, is that um, they're low productivity. And so, if we if we try to, you know, take a look at, um, you know, how many wind turbines it takes to equal the input from, let's say, natural oh, yeah. gas. Or coal or something else and and the way that power plants do this is they've got this measure called power density and I think I showed a slide uh, last June in Miami to this effect the power density just says you know you bring me some form of energy whatever it is and it comes into my facility and it takes up a certain amount of, of, of space square foot or cubic square meter kind of space so how much power can I draw from that surface area? And, and if you think about it in terms of workers, okay, so let's say a natural gas worker is, you know, the way, I mean, if, you, if you're a power plant, you got to hire some people. Do you want to hire one worker, 10 workers, or 100 workers? Well, you'd rather hire one really productive worker as opposed to 100 less productive workers. Well, in terms of, <clears throat> of natural gas as a worker standard, uh, wind is about, it, it takes about a thousand wind workers to equal one natural gas worker. Right. So would you rather have one guy working in your plant or a thousand guys? They, they both produce the same amount of power. Yeah. Well, you'd rather have one guy. And that's and the problem. You cannot, compete. you cannot compete with fossil energy for energy content per unit volume or area. It's not a it's not a bias that I have. It, it's a fact of physics. You can't do right. it. And isn't there another metric that, where they measure the input of energy required to yes. get a specific output? So people don't understand that if you get one uh, barrel of oil, let's say, it actually 
takes energy to get that barrel of oil. So you want the highest ratio possible. For one input of energy here, you want 100, 1,000 uh, output energy units right. coming out the other side. And even <laughs> with solar and wind, there is still an input of energy to get a specific output. And right. I think I'm saying the same thing you just said, but there's another metric there, isn't it? It, yeah, it's called net energy or energy return on investment. There you go. Yep, that's it. And so if you look at, and, and these are, you know, these are a little bit squishy, these numbers, okay? And so um, I, I look at them notionally, but but the if, for, if you compare, let's say, wind, okay? Wind has something like a, you know, you put uh, one unit in and you get five units out. Okay, that's that's not really great, but it's okay. Yeah. With oil, you know, it's something like you put one unit in and you get 35 units out. Solar is, you know, maybe you put one unit in, you get three units out. Coal is somewhere, you know, in between. And so, I mean, those are the... And again, I, you know, I don't, I don't want anybody to, you know, write down those numbers and say those are the truth according to art. But those are, you know, but, but from a, from a proportional standpoint, you know, that's probably about right. And yeah. so what that's saying is, is sort of the same thing I was just saying with the, you know, the natural gas workers versus the wind workers is that there's a huge gap between what you can get from, from fossil energy versus renewable energy. And, and yeah. you know, it's not a, you know, it, it's not a, a criticism. It's just a fact. And 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 there's going to be somebody watching us today saying, oh yeah, but you know, somebody's gonna, you know, somebody's gonna find some new technology that changes all that. Well, maybe, maybe not. But the the reality is, is that, um, you know, if if you care at all about the ecosystem of the earth or the climate or any of those things. You know, we don't have a hundred years to figure that out. I mean, if it's if it's not feasible today, at least on some level, it's probably not part of that solution. Doesn't mean we should stop working on it. And and the other thing too, I, I think that the technology is 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 another one of those shiny things that uh, oh well, somebody will figure this out. Well, man, I don't want to bet my portfolio on that. You know? <laughs> You know, I want to see some kind of some kind of a graph and some kind of numbers, um, you know, and again, maybe, you know, I'll put five percent of my money into something that's a what if and a maybe. And if it hits, fantastic. But, you know, I don't want to bet my family's future on that. So that's the problem. It, you know, it's not a criticism of wind. It's just it's not it, it's not a very productive form of energy. Yeah. The good Somebody news, I'll say, I'll say the good news here to conclude is that throughout history, that is one thing that human beings have done well. Uh, we've yeah. criticized a lot of human beings today, mostly the central planners and authoritarians and political leaders. But yep. for the rest of us, the average Joes and Janes, uh, throughout history, we've been able to solve some pretty complex problems. I remember one example that I, I heard my good buddy Simon Black talk about is when we went from the Bronze Age to, I don't know what the, the next, but they they, they, they they discovered tin, or no, no, they needed tin as an right. input to bronze. And it was pretty much the same thing, that they're running out of tin. It's it's like, it's we're at peak tin, we're not going to have it for that much longer. And mm -hmm. it was a very similar type of argument to what we have today. Obviously, a lot less uh, impactful, probably, on the planet and whatnot. But it was the same type of, and then they came out with iron, to your point, and that they, we as a society, as a population, uh, we figured out a solution. So I'm like you, I don't like angel investing, so I wouldn't want to bet my whole portfolio on it. But it does give me room for optimism that if the human race is able to do what it does best, if we're not shackled to, to such a great degree by the central planners, then uh, I'm pretty hopeful that we'll we'll figure out a solution. And and I agree with that, George. And and I would add only that in the case of an energy crisis, probably the worst thing you do is support those prices with subsidies. 
or suppress those prices. Yeah, exactly. You need to have prices increase to naturally let the price me mechanism work to decrease demand. I, mean, I don't want anybody to starve or freeze in the dark or anything like that. I mean, you know, you have to approach it in a measured way, but you know, to you know, to draw down our our national strategic petroleum reserve so that Americans can pay fifty cents less per gallon for gasoline. That that that's not a good. I mean, okay, you want to win the election? I get it. All right, but but I mean that by by making gasoline cheaper. All that does is cause people to use it more. And yeah. so before very long, you're right back to the problem you had to begin with, right? Yeah, we're just digging ourselves in a deeper hole. Exactly.